Donkey Kong meets Phoenix Wright, Legend of the Crystal Turnabout. While our last episode introduced us through the opening act, our second episode brings us to the second day on the island and an important turning point for this vacation. Congo Bongo Bay Hotel Room. When last we joined the vacationing duo of Phoenix Wright and Maya Fay, their tropical getaway was kickstarted by an exciting tour of Congo Bongo, sanctioned by the island's peculiar residents, a band of walking, talking primates. After shaking off their initial surprise, Phoenix and Maya were delighted by the ape's hospitality. Yet their first day was not without conflict, as an undertone of unrest pervaded the day's activities, with the island's future ruler Donkey Kong at the center of it all. Will this fabulous vacation go off without a hitch, or will the Kong family drama unravel it at the seams? As the sun rises on the island of Congo Bongo, Phoenix and Maya awaken in their luxurious beachside hotel room. Rise and shine, Nick! <sighs> Yesterday wasn't a dream, right? There were actual talking monkeys and apes, right? Sure were. At least seven of them. And Larry is now, in fact, a pilot? He must be. Who else flew the plane here? Okay. Yep. This is real. Not that this is a bad thing. I'm having a lot of fun. I just wanted to make sure. Fair enough. We should get going to Treetop Town. The others are probably waiting for us. Well, time to roll. Treetop Town. As expected, the Kongs of Congo Bongo are all out and preparing for breakfast. Good morning! Did you two sleep well? I was out like a light. <laughs> Haven't slept that well in years. At least somebody slept well because I sure didn't. I don't know how it happened, but I was already standing when I woke up. Must have been sleepwalking or something. Whatever the case, my hip is killing me. Mm. I didn't get much shot high eater, dudes. I was out in my plane making runs until the wee hours. Well, on the bright side, it's a beautiful morning, and it looks like we'll have a great day ahead. In addition, you both picked a good time to arrive. My dear Mumsy baked enough banana nut muffins for the whole island. You don't have to tell me twice. Maya bolts to the table with blinding speed, her neurons seemingly activated at the scent of Bluster's baked goods. And I thought I was hungry. Phoenix takes his seat as well, as Dixie and the others begin setting the tables with various breakfast dishes, including the ever-present bananas. There's clearly no shortage here. Oh, Candy! Won't you try some? These muffins have a lot in common with me, you know. Your mother regrets making the muffins, too? Actually, it's that we're both piping hot, scrumptious, and... Hey, wait a moment! <laughs> Was the joke really that funny? Maya and I don't really say or do anything because it's kind of awkward as it is. Bluster just takes his seat with his arms crossed and a frustrated look of indignance on his face. Ah, <laughs> uh, Bluster can be full of it sometimes, so we just poke fun at him whenever he starts to get annoying. Which is always... <laughs> Will you knuckle-draggers knock it off? While you lot are busy being baboons to each other, I'm over here starving! He seems a lot more ornery than yesterday. Maybe his hip acting up is putting him in a foul mood. Suddenly, Donkey Kong puts a coconut on the table and grabs Cranky's walking cane to position it like a cue stick. Oh no, is it happening again? DK leans over the table with one eye closed, aiming his shot. As if pockets on a billiards table, each Kong has their head leaned against the edge with their mouth open. DK knocks the coconut into a bundle of bananas in the center, which scatter every which way and slide into everyone's mouths. How in the world did they all get peeled? Was everybody just ready to do that on a moment's notice? These banana gags just raise more questions than I care to ask. At this point, I'm actually invested in seeing how far these banana antics can escalate before they start running out of ideas. With that performance over, we get a few uninterrupted moments to chow down. Bluster's mom sure makes a mean banana nut muffin. I should get going. Gotta be at work soon. Actually, Candy, I realize that it's rather ungentlemanly of me to expect you to work 
during such a momentous celebration, that is. What do you say to a day off with full pay, hmm? That way you can join the others on the island tour. Wow! Really? That's really swell of you, Bluster. Think nothing of it. <laughs> uh, go and have fun. I think the factory will survive a vacation day or two. That said, I do have business I need to resolve, so I will bid you all farewell. Wow. He's really not such a bad guy. So, am I welcome to join you all on the tour? Of course! Great. I'll go get ready and grab some stuff from the house, and I'll be back in maybe 15 or 20, okay? So sorry to jet my dudes, but I've got to get to work. Got a full day of half lion action ahead. Keep it real, though. So what's our game plan today? A frightful foray into the Forbidden Forest? A swing at swashbuckling some scallywags on the salty seas? A luxurious luau with a limbo line? Well, there aren't too many places left we haven't already seen. All that's left is the Forbidden Forest, like you said, as well as the White Mountains, and then the Pirate's Cove. We should probably be done with the tour before dinner. I'm glad Candy will be coming along too. As Candy heads off to freshen up, Phoenix and the others take a few minutes to let their food settle. Huh? Right in front of our very eyes, a bright light flashes, and a floating figure appears? Is that a g ghost No way! Inka Dinka do? What brings you here? The translucent apparition hovering before the group has the appearance of a totem pole composed of several stacked cubes. One particular section appears to have a face carving adorned upon it. I think I recall hearing about this Inka Dinka do character yesterday briefly. He had something to do with the crystal coconut if memory serves. He must have special powers as well to be projecting himself in front of us from far away. Uh, is, is this thing on? <clears throat> there is big trouble, and my temple may soon be laid waste. To me, the wisest of all the Kongs must make haste. Inka Dinka 2 needs my help! DK lifts one leg and pulls his arms to one side, like a cartoon character about to go into a full sprint. Before he can run, Cranky swings his cane rather forcefully to bonk DK on the head. Uh, hey! Ow! What did you do that for? He said he needed help from the wisest one on Congo Bongo, you nitwit. There are only two wise people on this island. One of them's me, and unless your name's David and you compose the music, the other one's not you. I did mean Cranky. Aw, oh, come on! I'll be right there. Now of all times, why does it gotta be my Before long, the elderly primate is out of sight. In another small flash, Inka Dinka Doo vanishes as suddenly as he appeared in the first place. So, uh, what exactly is Inka Dinka Doo to you all? A uh, deity? Royalty? I don't really get the deal with him. The Kong's trade looks as if they're all hoping someone else among them has any idea. With no indication of a clear answer, they all simply shrug. To be honest, we forget about him most of the time. But he has kooky crazy powers, like you just saw. So we take him seriously. Ah, uh, generally what he says goes. I bet he's like cranky and thinks I'm not ready either. Ah, cheer up, DK. If you had been summoned by him, you'd miss out on the rest of the tour. Hey, you're right, little buddy. Good point. All right, I'm ready. Shall we get started? Let's go, everyone! Forbidden Forest As the tour group treks through the jungle, they pass through an expansive stretch of jungle and find themselves in more jungle. Except with some fog, I guess. We've been walking through here for a while now. To be honest, I couldn't tell the difference between when we crossed over into the Forbidden Forest as opposed to when we were trekking around the regular jungle. Like, I can't even recall a transition point. So, uh, Dixie, what makes the Forbidden Forest so forbidden? Bog monster. Bog monster? Big bog monster. I see, I see. No, just ignore Did. He's making that up. Oh yeah? If the bug monster isn't real, then where'd DK go, huh? Everyone stops walking to pivot and look in all directions. 
Sure enough, their group is down one. Uh, Donkey Kong, where do you go? See, what I tell you? The Bog Monster ate DK. Diddy stands with crossed arms as he closes his eyes and nods. His confident nodding motions slow until they stop completely, and his eyes open and widen as a deeper realization hits. Seems like Diddy wasn't expecting DK to show up and tap him on the shoulder so suddenly. What? Why is everyone looking so surprised? We thought a bog monster ate you. Huh? That's just some prank Diddy made up. He's been tricking people for like 20 years with that one. Look at all your faces, was priceless! <laughs> but where did you go, DK? As it turns out, Cranky used the crystal coconut to talk with me. He actually invited me over to his house to talk about some stuff. Looks like I got some important future ruler work to do after all. Sorry gang, but I've got to make like a banana and split. I'll join back up with you later. Donkey Kong takes his leave and then the forest is quiet once again. So, uh, was there anything special about this area other than the Bog Monster story? The Kongs momentarily look at one another. Now that I think about it, I guess not. No. Uh, let's just move on to the next part of the tour. We've got some white mountains to climb, everyone! Dixie must be talking about the huge peaks that we could see from the plane when we first landed here. How exciting! I bet the view from up there will be magnificent! White Mountains Despite the mountain size, that climb was actually not bad at all. There was a pretty well-made path from the base to a relatively flat area higher up on the mountains. Before climbing their way up the mountain, Phoenix and Maya changed to clothing fit for snowy weather. You know, it's really convenient that you had human-sized jackets and ski pants at the base of the mountain. Whoa, check it out, Nick! I can see the village from here! Yep, the view from up here is one of the best things about Cago Vago Island! For real! For real. You really can see everything from up here! Huh, I guess Larry is here now too. Are you really that surprised, Phoenix? Oh, hey Larry. You've been up here this whole time? Larry has a painter's pallet in hand and has set up a large easel stand near a sleeping bag on the ground. Yep, sure have. Artistic inspiration struck me when I saw this place. I just knew I would have to get a good look at things from way up here. I've been painting a landscape of Congo Bongo. You wanna see? Well, sure, I'll have a look, but aren't you a pilot now? A guy can never have too many hobbies. We take a look at the piece that he was speaking of, and it's actually rather impressive. You're a really good painter, Larry. Hey, nice work, Larry. I'm assuming by the colors and the moon in the sky, this was a nighttime piece? Hey, you got it. This place is gorgeous under the light of the full moon. What's that weird thing shaped like a capital T? Maybe it was Funky Kong's plane? His plane has a T shape, kind of. Uh, I'm not actually sure. Whatever it was flew by so fast that it was gone in an instant. It sure was breathtaking though, so I just had to include it. Well, I'm sure I've taken up enough of your group's time. I'm gonna stick around up here for a bit and try to get a daytime piece as well. But I tell you what, I would like for you to take this picture with you, Nick. When you guys get back down, would you be able to give this painting to the village? It can be my little way of saying thanks for the hospitality. Before I can even respond, Maya speaks up and nabs the painting from Larry. Sure can, and I'll strap it on my back with this extra rope, so it stays secure. Now, what's next on the tour, Dixie? Dixie walks towards one of the mountainous inclines, which has several boards and skis leaned against it. Well, we're going to ride down the mountain slope to Pirate's Cove, which is right over in that direction. R ride down the mountain? I... Uh... I don't know if I'm up to that. That sounds a little dangerous. No need to worry. This path we'll be taking doesn't have any trees or rocks. It's a very safe route. Come on, Nick! You only live once, so let's have some fun! Well, if you say so. Everyone gears up for a cool, wild, and groovy ride down the mountain. Maya grabs a snowboard and Phoenix takes a set of skis. I should be fine if I just remember that in order to slow down and stop, I have to do the thing where you bend the skis until they look like a pizza slice. 
Or was it to split them apart so they look like french fries? I can't remember whether it's the pizza or the french fries to put on the brakes! Good luck and have fun! I'll be up here if you need me for anything! Well... Here goes nothing. The members of the tour group slap on their goggles and hit the trails. Woo! Yahoo! <laughs> here we go! Pirate's Cove. Oh, if this were a race and there were a finish line, Maya would have zipped across it before any of us. She was fast as lightning. Even Dixie, Candy, and Diddy couldn't keep up. Oh, it takes us a moment, but we finally reached the base of the slope as well. Woohoo! Did you see me, Nick? Did you watch me Euro curve into a back size 360 double hand drag before that last powder slash? I don't have an earthly idea what any of that means. Just smile and nod, Phoenix. Smile and nod. This is the last stop on our tour, folks. Welcome to Pirate's Cove! Oh boy, are we going to meet real pirates? Do you guys have ape pirates? Ape pirates? Is that what you were expecting? Let me tell you, there be no apes in this crew. There be only the slimiest, scaliest, scariest crocs that could ever appear in your worst nightmares. Yar, the group be approached by... <clears throat> Excuse me. The group is approached by a huge orange crocodile walking on two legs and wearing a pirate hat. He has deadly teeth, razor-sharp claws, and is holding a miniature cannon in his hand. I'm actually surprised with myself for not reacting more strongly towards this development. He's not nearly as intimidating as I would have imagined a five-foot-tall crocodile to be. What are ye all doing in me cove, yar? And what in the world are those two supposed to be? The pirate gestures at Phoenix and Maya with a look of skepticism. Hi, Maya, and this is Nick. Maya holds out her hand to shake his. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the best idea, Maya. Thankfully, after a moment of confusion, the pirate returns the handshake. Aye, how rude of me. I'm Captain Scurvy, the meanest, rudest scourge to ever sail the seven seas. Nice to meet you, lads. So, you're an honest-to-goodness pirate? Arr, that I be. And what are you two? You look to be a right bit more civilized than the rest of the monkey's uncles around these isles. Still, though, what brings you to our cove? They're tourists. We've been showing them around the island. Now that sounds like a barrel full of fun. Yar, <laughs> yar, ouch, ow, ow. You will have to excuse me. I must have pulled me hip from all the swashbuckling. Blasted thing's been driving me mad all day. Anyway, I imagine you have many questions about old Captain Scurvy, I. What happened to the other two pirates in your crew? Uh, budget cuts. Do you live on Congo Bongo as well? Aye, for the time being, that is. At least until I get what's rightfully mine. Scurvy's great, 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 Hit the prize within the eye of Inka Dinka Doo. So, Donkey Kong found the crystal coconut after it fell out of Inka Dinka Doo's eye. And because of that, he's prophesied to be the next ruler of the island. But now you're telling me that the crystal coconut didn't even belong to Inka Dinka Doo in the first place? What right would he have to own it? Nick? Who then made a prophecy about ruling? How is there a prophecy from this island about rulership of this island around an item that wasn't even on this island to begin with? Nick! And furthermore, why was it hidden here in the first place? Why didn't Scurvy's great-great-great-grandfather just keep it if it was his? Nick! Frankly, this also brings to question the legitimacy of Inka Dinka Doo in general. Why do- Nick! What? What? Maya grabs her friend's arm and shakes him as she shouts, snapping him out of his overly analytical stupor. You went into courtroom mode again. I'm sorry, Maya. It's just that there are so many unanswered questions. Shh. It'll be all right. It's just a kid's show. Hey, guys. 
Everyone present turns to see DK walking in their direction and waving his arm. In his other hand, he's holding some sort of pie. I'm back! Did you miss me? Oh, and hey, Scurvy, how's it going? Arr, Donkey Kong, is it? You prism pilferin' bilge rat! Oh, I have half a mind to make you walk the plank. Even half a mind may be giving you too much credit. <laughs> oh, butt out, you pint-sized primate. As for ye, Donkey Kong, you got some nerve coming here after humiliating me the last time. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. Would it make you feel better if I shared some of this banana cream pie with you? Yar! Scurvy swipes one of his fingers across it, catching a small bit of the pie and tasting it. Um, oh. oh, that'd be some delicious pie. All right, you win. We'll call it square. Anybody else want any? There's plenty to go around. Maya, Diddy, and Candy all take DK up on his offer. As they bite into the pie, their faces suggest that it's every bit as good as Scurvy described. Dixie and I are both good, but appreciate the gesture. This must be a fight, DK. Cranky left it in his fridge for me. I think it was his way of apologizing for how he was treating me earlier. That's swell. I'm glad to hear they're both getting along again. Well, uh... I don't have anything else on this tour, so... Congratulations on making it through our first ever island tour extravaganza! Now what do you say we all go back to Treetop Town for a nice lunch? Sounds good to me! Dar, have fun, mateys, and see you around! As we head out, Scurvy waves goodbye to us. He's actually a rather nice guy, all things considered. Treetop Town. Things are relatively quiet as the tour group reaches the town's wooden walkways after taking the barrel elevators. But as they approach the dining table where they shared breakfast earlier, they find a group of Kongs waiting for them. Cranky, Bluster, and Funky are all here. But there's another ape with them. One who has white fur and a wool beanie. And none of them look too pleased. They all stand with crossed arms and frowns on their faces. Their glares are sharper than daggers, and they're all looking directly at... DK? Hey guys, what's up? Uh, why the angry looks? Cranky walks up to DK and bashes the big ape on the head with his cane. Ouch! What was that one for? Ignoring the inquiry, Cranky swipes what's left of the pie out of DK's hand. Give me that, you dolt! I know his name's Cranky, but right now, it looks like his anger is at a boiling point. Cranky, what gives? Come and look, Diddy. Just come and see for yourself. Cranky's cabin. The inside of the spacious cabin seems to look the same as before at a glance. But something feels different here, and I can't tell what. Cranky continues walking us towards the pedestal in the center housing the crystal coconut. He jabs his walking cane at the ground, which triggers the seed-shaped container to open. All that's inside are some food smudges and... A bunch of glass shards! The crystal coconut! It's... BROKEN! As everyone is struggling to process what they're seeing, Cranky lifts his cane and points it upwards, right at DK's face. Donkey Kong broke the crystal coconut! What? Me? Why would I do that? You were ordered to prove fat in your hands, Donkey Dude. We all saw you walking around the town with that banana cream pie. Upon closer inspection, that seems to be what the residue inside the container is. Smudge as a banana cream pie. I knew you were childish, but I never thought you'd stoop so low. You've got it all wrong. Craggy, you're the one who told me I could have that banana cream pie. I did no such thing. You aren't going to lie your way out of this one, you big oaf. you got to believe me. I would never do that! Despite all of DK's pleading, Cranky motions for the new Kong with white fur to grab DK and hold him. Practically everyone in the room is sad and hanging their heads low. Urgh. Eddie, take him to that holding cave in the White Mountains. We'll figure out what to do with him later. Boy, hey, my hip is in far too much pain to deal with all this right now. Me sorry for this. 
Despite the regret in his voice, the Kong named Eddie escorts DK out of the cabin. Maya and I look at one another. We've been here long enough to recognize how much of a big deal this whole thing is to the Kongs. Though Cranky and the others stay behind, all of us who are on the tour follow Eddie up the mountain to where DK will be held. It's a sad, silent walk. None of us can think of anything to say or do. White Mountains. The mean old detention center. Once we reach the cavernous area inside of the White Mountains, DK is thrown into a cell, and icicle prison bars are shut closed, trapping him. He doesn't even bother getting up from the floor. He just lays there. Jeez, I feel so bad for him. Donkey Kong, don't worry. We'll figure out a way to fix this. I, I just know we will. Don't bother. What? We know you didn't break the crystal coconut. You'd never do that. It doesn't matter. <sighs> Even if I didn't break it, I may as well have. I wasn't there to protect it and that's what counts. Craggy was right. I'm no ruler of anything. Hey, big guy, you don't mean that, do you? You can't give up. You just can't. Oh, but he can give up. And he will. Slightly startled by an unfamiliar voice, Phoenix turns to see where it's coming from. The torchlights of the cave slowly illuminate a group of three approaching crocodiles. The leader of the group, walking front and center, makes his authority clear. His scales are reptilian green and his large figure is imposing. The croc adorns ostentatious amounts of regalia on himself, wearing gold bracelets, a large gold belly plate, and a golden crown with jewels atop his head. As he parades himself forward, he flourishes a luxurious red cape. Oh no! It's King Karul and his goons! Wait, this island has a king now? Is he also a pirate? Is he king of the pirates? If you compare me to that sad excuse for a crocodile on the beach, you won't be leaving this place in one piece, I assure you! What are you chumps doing here? It looks to me as if I'm not the chump here, chimp. At least, I'm not the one behind bars. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a nice touch. What do you call this? This is a jail, isn't it? Sure seems that way. Ah, jail! I do like this jail concept. It's certainly satisfying to see poor Donkey Kong thrown in this jail. To answer your question, however, I'm here to see my dear old nemesis off. What kind of a rival would I be if I didn't even show up to say goodbyes with Donkey Kong before he goes away forever? Hey, Maya? Phoenix? I know this isn't your problem at all, and I'm sorry that this is ruining your trip, but is there anything you could think of to help DK? He means a lot to us. Please, if there's anything you can think of. Gosh, he needs help. They're going to banish him tomorrow. I don't want them to banish my Donkey Kong. What? They're already deciding to banish him? Yes, for doing something this bad. It's the only thing they can do. But what if the evidence doesn't support the accusation? Can't we just prove that DK is innocent? How the heck would we do that? I mean, isn't... DK going to be put on trial? You'd prove him innocent in a courtroom, right? A what room? Wait. Karul didn't know what a jail was, and they seem to be dealing punishment without a fair chance. I'm hitting a stark realization. Congo Bongo doesn't have a legal system, does it? Oh boy, here we go. It looks as if one of Karul's eyebrows is rising, but it is in fact his left eye itself bulging unnaturally. He takes a cartoonishly long single step towards Phoenix and gets right in his face to look him in the eyes. It's personal space, man. You there! What do I call you? My name's, uh, Phoenix Wright. Well, Phoenix Wright, what you've been speaking of, shall we say, interests me. Do explain more, won't you? 
Well, mm, where to start? I guess the simplest way to explain would be where Maya and I come from in human society, we have systems in place to try and prevent people from being blamed for bad things they may not have actually done. When someone is accused of committing a crime, they have a chance to hire a lawyer who then defends them. And then they fight to the death? No, no, not that kind of defense. We have a system in place where we determine what's right and what's wrong. I'm sure you all have similar laws, yeah? More or less. Well, we also have a court system where we hold trials for people who are accused of breaking those laws. A lawyer takes up their defense by arguing for their side, trying to prove that the accused person didn't break any laws and didn't commit any crimes. Court exists specifically so we can protect someone from being blamed without a fair trial. Hmm, how very interesting. So what about if they did do the crime? Do we have to prove it in this court as well? That would be the job of the prosecutor, who is also a type of lawyer. A prosecutor tries to use evidence to prove that the accused person did do the crime. And whichever lawyer is able to prove the best points and reveal the truth will ultimately decide whether or not that person is guilty and convicted, or innocent and let free. How does this process start? The prosecution works with detectives who help to investigate the scene of the crime, and the defense lawyer does their own investigation too. We try to find as much evidence and information as possible to prepare for the trial, and then... Yes! Sold! We have a deal! In a very startling manner, Karul excitedly grabs Phoenix's hand with both of his, and begins shaking it up and down so rapidly that the lawyer starts to look more like a bobblehead than a person. <laughs> I am nothing if not civilized, the very portrait of a gentleman, and I think it would be grand of you to give us the chance, once and for all, to convict Donkey Kong of this crime fair and square. Then no one will be able to contest that I, King Karul, am the true ruler of Congo Bongo. <laughs> We're all a mix of confused as well as concerned. It's very clear this guy is bad news, and he blatantly has it out for DK. <clears throat> so, with that being said... General Club, Crusher! So yes, sir! King Karul is joined by the other two crocodiles at his sides. General Clump is round and has a more olive coloration. He wears a military helmet, combat boots, and a supply belt. Krusha is very tall, has blue scales, and wears camo patterned cargo pants as well as a tank top. They both salute dutifully in response to being called upon. I'm going to have a talk with Cranky Kong about all of this. I'm appointing you two as detectives on this case. Go to the crime scene to investigate and find proof that Donkey Kong is the one who committed the crime. Well, Donkey Kong, I suppose we'll see one another very soon. Oh well. <laughs> uh, what do we do now? How do we be detectives? That's easy, Crusher. King Karul wants us to make sure Donkey Kong gets thrown in jail. So we're gonna march on over to that crime scene and do just that. Kremlins! Ten, Jun, about, face, forward, march. Oh, Congo Bongo, please worry no more. Karul's prosecution will settle the score. Donkey Kong, now you're no longer the king. We'll put you inside that jail thing. You thought we were morons and thought we were dim, but now we have triumphed. I call that a win. Now we're detectives, and here's what that means. You'll be found guilty once we search the scene. Donkey Kong, look how the tables have turned. This is the fate that you certainly earned. Have fun in prison, you dumb ding a ling. We'll put you inside that uh, jail. What is it, my turn to see? All our King Kong rules, Steve DK has thwarted completely. Uh, but now DK's bad. So this time we're in the right legally. 
I don't get it. What don't you get, soldier? Do we really have to follow the legal rules? Yes, it's thematically appropriate and morally satisfying. But we skipped Avius Corpus. Oh, now you're just overthinking things. Privilege! Attention! Forward! March! Well, that sure was something. <clears throat> Is everyone here prepared to jump into song and dance at a moment's notice? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for standing up for DK like that. Me have question. What is it, Eddie? Where'd you get lawyer to help DK? Hmm, I guess we need to find someone who could be one, huh? Nick's a lawyer. Oh man, Phoenix, will you be my lawyer? I really need someone to save my bacon right now! <sighs> I knew what I was getting into the moment I brought it up. Of course I'll be your lawyer. So what can we do to help you? Well, we'll need a location to be set up like a courtroom. Leave that to me, Nick! Oh, right. Larry's up here on the mountain too. I can help them set up a courtroom. I've been in one plenty of times, so I know exactly what they look like. I'll paint them a picture of one. Oh, nice save, Larry! Next, we would need a judge to oversee the trial. The judge watches and makes sure that no rules are broken, and they make the final decision, too. Hey, Inka Dinka too could do that! He's always fair about everything! Okay, and I guess lastly, we would need everyone involved to read up on the basics of how a trial works. How are we going to do that? Do you have any law books with you? <sighs> Unfortunately, no. I've got you covered on that one, too. Check it out. I have a strategy guide for the game Justice for All. They can just read up on how the first few trials go, and we will be all set. Larry, I have got to say, I never expected you to be a godsend in a situation where an impromptu trial needs setting up. But it sounds like I can trust things to you while Maya and I go investigate. Thanks. No sweat. Leave it to me. I know just where we can go to set up the courtroom. I'll leave the rest to you, Phoenix and Maya. Dixie and Diddy leave with Larry to go down to the jungle and prepare the courtroom for the upcoming trial. Hey, Phoenix and Maya, I want to thank you. Both of you, really, truly. You guys have been nothing but swell to me and the rest of us since you got here. I'm really glad you two came to Congo Bongo. Me too, DK. Don't you worry about a thing. We'll get you out of here in no time. Right now, it's just Phoenix and Maya, alongside Donkey Kong in the jail cell, and Eddie, who is keeping guard. Well, time to get to work. Maya and I will have to go down to Treetop Town to look at the crime scene in a little bit. But before even that, I need to get Donkey Kong's side of the story. His spirits are higher than when we got here, that's for sure. I'm still worried about the Crystal Coconut being smashed, but... Man, Phoenix, I owe you big time! I thought I was a goner for sure! With you getting me out of trouble, I'm sure we can figure out what happened and fix it! We'll take things one step at a time. So, the very first thing I need to know is what you were doing in Cranky's house. I told you guys, didn't I? DK begins to pace back and forth along the length of the jail bars. And as he moves, he holds out a banana, which repeatedly clinks against each bar. Uh, hold on, how does a banana make a clinking sound? <sighs> Never mind. You did tell us that Cranky asked you to come over, but can you give me more details as to what you two talked about and why you were invited? Well, we were on the tour and Cranky used the Crystal Coconut to appear. He told me, sorry about arguing with you the other day. Why don't you come on over to my cabin so we can smooth things over? I said, I said, sure. And then he said, I'm out running errands for Inka Dinka Do, so I may actually be gone for a while. If you get there and I'm not there yet, you can have the last banana cream pie I left on the fridge. Think of it as a way of apologizing. Hmm. He's not hiding the fact that he was in the home at all. He's been extremely honest about it, in fact, and how he claims Cranky gave him permission to come to the cabin to take the banana cream pie. However, Cranky himself denied all of that. So here comes our first inconsistency. Right from the get-go, it's our client's word against Cranky's. This has me considering all kinds of different factors at work, namely the relationship between the two of them. Donkey Kong, how long have you and Cranky known one another? Are you two generally on good terms? Well, you see, uh, actually, 
I was gonna say he's my grandpa, but I'm not actually all that sure, to be honest. I'm sure there's a very interesting family tree to be mapped out here, but we'll have to save that for another time. So, you're saying Cranky told you to come to his house, but Cranky is saying he didn't. Would he have any reason to lie? I was wondering the same thing. Is there any reason he would have to be dishonest? To call you over and then to lie about it almost makes me wonder if this was some kind of setup. What? No way! We have our differences, but he'd never do something like that. He may be cranky and rude and sometimes a jerk, and also a butthead, but he's not a liar. What about his memory? Not to sound rude, but he is up there in years. Is it possible that he may have forgotten inviting you over? I guess that would be more likely than him lying, at least. There's a lot of unanswered questions about Cranky's involvement. However, nothing yet that I can immediately tell would weigh heavily into the fact that the Crystal Coconut ended up broken. DK, is there anything else you can tell me about what happened while you were at Cranky's house? Well, he wasn't actually there. Just like he said he might not be. So I waited for a bit. He still wasn't there by the time I got bored. So he went ahead and took the banana cream pie he offered me and went to join back up with you guys. And from that point on, you were with us the whole time. If nothing else happened while you were there... What are you thinking, Nick? Donkey Kong, did you check on the crystal coconut at all while you were there? No, I figured if Cranky was using it to speak with me and he wasn't there, then he probably had it. From that angle, it's possible the crystal coconut wasn't even there at the same time you were. For better or worse, we have no idea when it left the cabin, when it came back to the cabin, or when it broke. That may actually be Fortune smiling on us. Given that unknown, it's more likely that DK was nowhere near it to begin with, which in turn makes it easier to prove that he didn't do it. It still doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't make sense why Cranky would call you over to his home in the first place. It's all too suspicious. So, DK. You are absolutely sure that it was indeed Cranky who called you, and he did so using the crystal coconut? No doubt about it. There's only two ways to do the freaky appears a ghost thing. You either need to use the crystal coconut, or Inka Dinka Doo himself has to use his powers. I'll keep that in mind. I appreciate the help, DK. I think it's a good time for Maya and myself to go down to the cabin to check out what things look like there. Alright. Best of luck, guys. And thanks again! Bye-bye! With DK and Eddie waving them goodbye, the dynamic, dependable duo of Phoenix and Maya head off to investigate the scene of the crime. Treetop Town, Cranky's Cabin. Here we are again, the exterior of Cranky's Cabin. The more I look at it and all of its intricacies, the more I question if Cranky Kong actually lives here. To say nothing of the gigantic monkey design hanging over the entrance, the inside is still so cluttered that it looks like a storage room to a museum. Maya and Phoenix step aside just in time to avoid getting run over by two crocodiles running at a full sprint, who zip by and crash into the side of the cabin. Those two are called... Clump and Crusha, if memory serves. They look like they'll be seeing stars for a few moments. Hey, uh, you guys left a lot earlier than we did. How did we get here before you? Oh, uh, well, we ran into some complications in the Forbidden Forest, see? Was it the Bog Monster? It was the Bog Monster. Crusha, who has been laid out flat on his stomach from the crash, reaches to grab hold of anything nearby to try and pull himself up. He happens to be right next to one of the circular art pieces surrounding the house. The first time I was here, I thought they looked like giant board game pieces. I wonder what they actually are, though. Russia, wait! Don't touch those! You remember what happens when those get pressed down, don't you? Good. S sorry. What exactly is that thing, anyway? These devious devices activate traps that those Kongs have set up all along these treetop walkways. They'll send you flying if you aren't careful. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking back to all the times they've gotten us. Uh, I always thought it was kind of fun to go flying. Keep your masochistic tendencies to yourself, Crusher. If Crocs were meant to fly, we'd have wings. I want to see. I'm really curious how they work. Um, well, I'm not exactly sure which switch activates which trap. 
So, uh, how about we all get inside Cranky's cabin? I know the traps are on the outside, so we'll be safe if we're inside. And, uh, Crusher, go find a really long stick for us to press one of them switches with. Phoenix and Maya do as instructed, while Clump and Crusha work together to hold a large tree branch steady as they reach out for the round device. The large button clicks loudly, and a single plank of the wooden walkway swings upward like a gigantic catapult. The board swung up at such a speed that anyone who had been standing there would, indeed, have been launched into the air. Thanks for, uh, the warning. I'm feeling quite relieved to be informed about such installations before accidentally finding out about them on our own. Hey, this button we just pressed has a print on it. It looks like a handprint. Sure enough, there's a mark on the device which we had just triggered with a branch, and this print looks like a hand had deliberately pressed down on it. Doing a quick look around the other various switches in the area, none of them have similar marks on them. It looks like this particular button was triggered very recently. How come the others don't have similar prints? Lest I remember, usually Cranky and the other Kongs jump on these switches to activate them. I don't think I've ever seen him, or anyone else for that matter, use just a bare palm to press them. That's... interesting. I'll take a picture of this just in case. I snap a photograph, as I have a feeling it will come in handy later. Perhaps the switches and traps around the cabin may have something to do with the crime? Or maybe Cranky just really doesn't like guests. Well, whatever the case, I add the barrel switch handprint to my evidence. The actual crime supposedly happened inside the cabin. So, let's go inside and check, yeah? As the group approaches the entrance, <coughs> the bird flies out and nearly rams into them. that? Some kind of tropical toucan? Ugh. I hope that wasn't who I think it was. Huh? Never mind that. We have a scene to investigate. The interior looks about the same as I remember it, but this time the crystal coconut's container is open. Where there used to be a splendid glass-like orb, there's now just shards of broken crystals as well as some smudges of what I assume is banana cream pie. Aha! Uh -huh. It looks like we've got the smoking gun right here. That's it. Case closed. Come on, Crusher. Help me gather this up. Be careful. Clump doesn't seem to realize that he's attempting to grab broken glass with his bare hands, and his attempt at quickly gathering a cluster ends, predictably, with... Ouch! That looked... painful. Uh, never mind that. We've got all the evidence we need right here. Let's report back to King Karul. Pronto. The two crocs hustle out of the building. We didn't even get a chance to check ourselves. There goes crucial evidence. Well, we will have to defer analyzing the broken shards ourselves until later. As regrettable as this turn of events is, we should review the rest of the crime scene. I'm confident that the environment itself will have enough evidence to paint a picture of what actually happened here. I'm going to check the fridge first. The remains of the banana cream pie at the scene are going to be a crucial piece of the puzzle. Whether or not Cranky only had one banana cream pie in the fridge might be important because there's a chance maybe someone else could have left those remnants. Good thinking. I've got a hunch of my own that we may be able to use. Before Maya heads toward the fridge, I take a photograph of the crime scene with my camera. I'll go ahead and call this new snapshot the crime scene photo. Now, I take out my vacation photos from the other day. Of the various pictures I snapped during the tour, I have some of both the exterior and interior of Cranky's cabin. Who knew that keeping a good photo journal of the vacation would come in handy in a legal battle? If I put together the crime scene photo with the vacation photos, I should be able to view any discrepancies at a glance. It will be like one of those spot the differences puzzles, really. A lot is still the same. The biggest and most noticeable things are mostly untouched, including the pipe organ as well as the golden ape statue that's holding a banana. None of the science equipment seems to be changed or moved either. The fridge is empty, Nick. So there was indeed only one banana cream pie, and it must be the one that DK took. But I see you're comparing photos. Neat. Can I help? I hold the two pictures to where Maya can see them as well as I can. Hmm. Yesterday, there was a full-size mirror over in that corner, but it's not here today. Huh. 
I definitely don't see a mirror here now though. But I do see an empty frame about the same size, propped up against the wall in roughly the same area. We go over to investigate a little more closely. Observing the frame, I'm able to see a few marks etched into the side of the wood. There are three evenly spaced marks on one side and one on the other. There are little cuts as if knives or some other sharp objects were sliced into the wood about a quarter of an inch. This is weird. Wonder what would have caused this? And there's a bigger question. If the frame is there, then what happened to the mirror pane itself? I'll make a note here that the mirror is missing. I add the mirror frame to the evidence list. The two notes I leave are of the strange cut marks and the missing pane. Anything else we can glean from comparing the photographs? I see small marks here and there in the photograph I took today. Let's get a closer look and see what they are. The first one I noticed was on the crystal coconut's pedestal. It's a small, line-like pattern of some cream tone color. What in the world is this, anyway? Call it a hunch. Maya swipes her finger through the mysterious substance and then she... tastes it? Ugh. Yep, it's banana cream. I withhold making a comment about the questionable nature of how sanitary that decision to... <clears throat> taste the crime scene was. Hmm... The next question is, what would have left a mark like this? It's much too small to be a handprint, or even a fingerprint. I can't say for certain, but... Maybe if we look around for more, we might find something else. Using the photographs as guides, we're able to locate another two places with similar marks. The case that had been holding the crystal coconut has the banana marks on it, and the handle to the refrigerator does as well. I think that may be the last of them. You should go ahead and take some photos and add them to the evidence, Nick. Time to add these strange banana markings to our evidence as well. I'd say we've made some decent progress, considering the prosecution ran off with major evidence. We'll just need to make do with what we have, though we're certainly underprepared. I'm not sure there's much else to be found here for the time being. Ah, <sighs> as usual, we'll have to walk into the trial tomorrow morning, hoping for the best. As long as we trust in our client, I'm positive everything will work out. The two of us get ready to work our way back to the hotel. The best we can do is get enough rest to hit the ground running tomorrow to prove Donkey Kong's innocence. It's chaos on Congo Bongo. While Phoenix's quick thinking was able to save Donkey Kong from an unjust fate, he also invited the challenge of DK's nemesis, the tyrannical King Karul. Will Phoenix and Maya be up to the challenge of taking on this reptilian litigator? Will they be able to prove DK's innocence? And just who is truly responsible for the dastardly deed of the Crystal Coconut's destruction? With more questions than answers, our heroic duo prepares for a trial like no other. To be continued. Ladies, gentlemen, and gentle Kongs, I hope you're having a blast enjoying the show. These banana gags are getting crazier and crazier, and I can't wait to see what's in store next time. Objection! Episode 3 will throw us right into the heat of the courtroom where our heroes will duel it out in a legal battle for the future of Congo Bongo. Please look forward to the next release. If you enjoy me, the narrator, then I'd love it if you could check out more of my work and personal projects. My name's Matt, I play guitar, and sometimes I post it on Instagram. If you want to check out any of the other superbly talented voices behind this interesting cast of Kongs and Kremlings, all of the information for myself, as well as my fellow cast members, will be linked in the description thingy below. As before, a special shout out to Dan Chaos one for continuing to provide unique and fantastic artwork for the backgrounds and evidence pieces of this series. Check out his other art and gaming channels, also linked in the description thingy. Thank you once again for continuing to support this audio drama project, and we promise to continue delivering more unforgettable memories. Please let us know your favorite scenes and moments in the comments, and subscribe to the channel so that you'll be first in line for the next episode's premiere. We look forward to seeing you next time.